Morning to all. Before we enter into the noon hours, Shri Thakur, Avay Kumar Ji Thakur, the finance officer, Banaras Hindu University, Professor Hum Su Kim, Professor Law School, Korea. Professor Badri Narayan uh, uh, in absentia has left us uh, to attend some other program. Professor Ajay Kumar, Head and Dean, Faculty of Law, Banaras Hindu University. Professor Adnish Kumar Patel, Professor Adesh Kumar, the learned faculty members, the scholars, staff members, students, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, indeed my privilege to address this August gathering on this inauguration of seminar where we have assembled to rekindle our thoughts on uh, 75 years of parliamentary democracy in India, retrospect and prospect. And of course, uh, to rededicate ourselves to the noble ideals uh, which uh, gave us independence and which are always the guiding lights in uh, all our endeavors. Before I switch on to a few points which I wanted to make, uh, I was uh, with uh, a great amount of uh, great feelings of uh, energy of the learned speakers before me. I was getting involved and uh, I could notice Professor Ajay Kumar indicated that the reasons for choosing this uh, topic for the seminar has essentially been that uh, of these 75 years, we have sweet memories and also some not so sweet or even sore memories too. Uh, certain challenges too, as uh, indicated by Sri Thakur also in his uh, address. Professor Ajay Kumar indicated a few of the areas of our concern including uh, the positioning of the governors vis-a-vis -vis the chief ministers or the persons of the elected governments like of some states like Kerala, Punjab, Delhi, Professor Badri Narayan indicated that uh, we need to remind ourselves as to whether this Amrit Kal, which uh, we are celebrating, is really Amrit, the nectar, is with us or not. Professor Kim, we are so thankful to you having given us insight into the democracy in March in Korea and particularly the different phases that democracy of Korea has gone through. Sri Thakur was uh, indicated he felt his presence here to be homecoming, but uh, he also indicated a few areas of concern and probably this uh, sealed envelope, Band Lifafa, was the last significant point Mr. Thakur made and indicated about 
how the Supreme Court declined to accept Man Lefafa or the sealed envelope, particularly when uh, any matter is requiring transparency in all its forms. While yes, so far the functioning of the judiciary is concerned, as we always know, the court means an open court. The presentation of the thing is always in the presence of everybody. Whatever is done has to be fully transparent. Justice must not only be done, it must appear to have been done, etc. But friends, when we have an orderly society and various norms of progression of the society, democracy particularly we would be talking about, in those norms it's not that Band Lifafa or the sealed envelope, the closed envelope is always a prohibition or always a denial. On the contrary, you all are, a lot of many of you, the students and the professors are here. Well, I would just remind well, all of us that uh, so far as your examinations are concerned, particularly when uh, there is a, an examination paper which is to be given to uh, an examinee only at the appointed hour and not before that. It has to perforce go in a sealed envelope. It cannot be made known unless, unless we transform the entire examination system into an open system or an open book system. There are certain examinations which are held like that too. There are several such things which per the force of requirement of a larger good of the society, they could be divulged, they could be shared at the opportune moment, at the appropriate moment, with the appropriate persons. Say, for example, presentation of the budget in the parliament. Well, per the force of the very job, per the force of its requirements and its implications, it need to remain in confines, it need to remain not known until there is a time to be known. Friends, my point only is that whenever we as a students of law will keep on reminding ourselves that whenever there is a particular principle, whenever there is a particular norm, where there is a particular way of doing things, well, the checks and balances, the requirements of and exceptions, the requirements, different requirements according to the needs, according to the particular setup or setting is interwoven in those uh, workings. Therefore, we do not, as students of law, will look at anything, particularly when we are dealing with the human beings and the civic society, anything in uh, absolute form or anything like having no exception or no room for well, modulations. So, but yes, I, I respect what Mr. Thakur has indicated, that so far as the courts are concerned, well, this is one of the fundamental norms that Yes, everything has to be open and transparent. When a particular party, who is always, everybody is equal before the court of law, is to present anything to the court, it has to be with all openness. Other side, as also the entire world must know as to what is being presented. But again, I would remind myself again, 
if I have closed a matter for judgment and my judgment is to be delivered, unless that judgment, until the time that judgment is delivered, it will remain within confines. So the confines are not unknown to the orderly working of the things and systems. Challenges and several serious challenges have been indicated and rightly so. The requirement, the promises right at the beginning when we started had been to make it sure that the person last in the corner, the person who is unknown, faceless, voiceless, well, gets the voice and is an equal participant in our democracy's working. Yes, these are the promises, these had been the promises, and we in 75 years, well, first of all, we need to appreciate how much we as collectively have done. Of course, we have to do a lot. That they, they, there would be requirements, constantly requirements, with the shifting paradigms uh, of the present days, the requirements are of uh, rapid progression and the requirements are now rapidly expanding themselves, rapidly altering their shapes also. But we are, we as a well-knit society, I will be just coming to that. The fraternity, this uh, one particular fundamentals of our constitution, our society, we have maintained it. Come what may and whatever had been our differences, whatever might be the differences, we as a country have maintained that fraternity. And that has been the reason. Just a, an example of that had been the, the challenges thrown by the COVID-19 pandemic. We collectively dealt with it. Of course, there were losses. Of course, there were such challenges, such unknown challenges, which for which none in the world was ready for it, we dealt with it collectively. It had been that collective conscience as also the capacity to, to, to act collectively. Well, that is one of the hallmarks of Indian democracy. We all are not only proud of that, but yes, we all are a humble servant of that hallmark, then that is how we progress. Before entering into other things, well, I, I, I am reminded of uh, those great lines of uh, Iqbal, which were recited in the Constituent Assembly also, when uh, they took up the task of well, preparing a document that would be, well, that would be our lifeline, that would be the heart and soul of this country when uh, it was recited that, and we keep on reminding that, and that is rather interwoven in us, that when Iqbal said, kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari, sadiyo raha hai dushman dore jaha hamara, Kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari. That is what we are and that is what we would always be progressing. That is what we would be dealing with. Friends, respect for the rule of law and a well-developed judicial system are the underpinnings of a democratic society and a modern economy. Democracy is not only a form of government or a framework of collective governance, but it's a system and process which organizes the societal life of individuals. If considered not solely as an instrument of government, but as a rule to which the entire society, including the government, is bound, the rule of law is fundamental in advancing democracy. 
what we are friends uh, is uh, succinctly stated how we were shaped and what we are and what we would be well uh, an insight we can take from the opening passage of the introduction on the website of the supreme court that reads as follows india and i'm quoting india has one of the oldest legal systems in the world its law in jurisprudence stretches back into the centuries forming a living tradition which has grown and evolved with the lives of its diverse people india's commitment to law is created in the constitution which constituted india into a sovereign democratic republic containing a federal system with a parliamentary form of government in the union and states an independent judiciary guaranteed fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy containing objectives which do not enforceable in law are fundamental to the governance of the nation this one paragraph broadly gives us a fair idea as to how india has been constituted into a republic democratic republic what are its ethos what had been its roots what it aspires and what it proposes friends dharma dharm or the rules of righteous conduct they evolved as a solution to the everlasting problem that arose from the man's natural instinct or desire for physical and emotional enjoyment wealth or material pleasures on being questioned by yudhishthir on the meaning and scope of dharma bhishma said it's in the shanti parv of mahabharat and uh, its translated version is when bhishma said it's most difficult to define dharma dharma has been described to be that which supports the upliftment of living beings thus that which guarantees welfare of living beings is surely dharma bhishma stated that the people were diverted from the path of dharma due to sensual desires passion and greed and stronger people begin to harass the weaker one as a remedy to this the threefold ideals of dharma arth and kaam were laid down for the welfare and happiness of the people and the fourth ideal being moksha or the desire to secure eternal happiness that was also prescribed and the king was entrusted with the responsibility of enforcement of dharma even though this term dharma has uh, such a broad meaning that it, it encompasses all rules such as uh, uh, spiritual moral and personal rules as well as civil criminal and constitutional law it in fact gives precise meaning depending on the context for example when the word dharm is used to refer to the giving of one's wealth for a public benefit it means charity when it is used to refer to giving of something to a beggar it means alms when it is held that in a given case dharma is in plaintiff's favor it means law or justice lies in his favor when it is said that it is son's dharma to look after his aged parents it means duty when it is said that a debtor's dharma to repay a debt to the creditor it implies legal and pious obligations this very dharm when used in the context of king's duties and powers it refers to raj dharm and we can definitely equate it with 
constitutional law. Friends, dharma is though intrinsically interwoven in every fundamental concept of a civic society, yet as regards the rules of governance, there is little or perhaps no evidence on the formation of a representative parliament or any such body of governors, though one would find some such concepts as being that of a benevolent monarch as propounded and exposited by Kautilya in Arthashastra. Mr. Thakur was referring to Kautilya's various expositions. It is seen that uh, in uh, our chronicled history, even without a nation state, the experiments in this part of the civilized world with representative governance started way back, maybe 6th century BC, in the form of republic, the Ganarajya, like the erstwhile kingdoms of Lichivi, Parva, Kapilvastu. We can definitely, for our learning, equate the modern day parliaments, cabinets, and prime ministers akin to the sabhas, samitis, and ganpatis of those republics. Friends, according to the smritis, the institution of kingship was established for the purpose of administering justice or enforcing dharma. All the Dharma Shastras and Smritis agreed that dispensation of justice was the highest dharma of the sovereign. Rather than elaborating on uh, the various features of the actions based on dharma, perhaps this one narrative would remind ourselves of the sanctions and supremacy of dharma as also the potential and power of the people where judicial ethos were put to test. The narrative is of a case decided in 1774 AD by Ramashastri, the Chief Justice to the Peshwas in the area now falling in the state of Maharashtra. The narrative is like this. After Peshwa Madhavrao died on 18th November 1772, his only surviving younger brother Narayan Rao, who was 17 years of age at that time, succeeded to the position of Peshwa. His uncle Raghunath Rao, who was, a, who was greedy for power, saw this as an opportunity and devised a plot to depose Narayan Rao. In, in, uh, in uh, execution of this plot, young Narayan Rao was assassinated on 30th August 1774. And Raghunath Rao assumed power as Peshwa. The Chief Justice Rama Shastri investigated Narayan Rao's murder and he found the accused, Raghunath Rao and 49 others, including a woman, guilty of murder and sentenced them to death. This decision was conveyed to the ruler, Peshwa Raghunath Rao. Because Raj Dharma granted the king the authority to determine the quantum of punishment as well as to have it executed. The Peshwa took no action because he himself was the first accused in the case. The Chief Justice kept insisting that his decision has to be carried out. As a result of this insistence, Raghunath Rao dismissed Ramashastri the Chief Justice, he quietly retired to his village. Dharma, on the other hand, asserted its supremacy, as the narrative goes, through none other but the people. The people refused to recognize and acknowledge Raghunath Rao as Peshwa because he was found guilty of murdering Narayan Rao, the lawful heir. After Raghunath Rao was deposed, a council of 12 people known as Barabhai that was formed to take over the administration. This case, friends, is a constant source of inspiration, a glowing tribute to the supremacy of dharma, the rule of law, the independence of judiciary and 
the exemplary conduct of a judge but above all the power of the people who refused to recognize raghunath rao we had had in uh, our systems and this is when we are talking when since we are just taking stock of in retrospect from where we started what are our roots there are a few these narratives these features need to be always with us in in this very setup we need to remind ourselves that we had a well defined legal system in this part of the world where there were different kinds of courts like the courts of kul court kul that is the family court shreni that the court of the that council of trade or profession gana court gan court that is the assembly of the village adhikrata court the court appointed by the king the sashita court the court of the king himself and then lastly nrip that is the king himself the second one was the court of king and lastly the king himself when we ek when we understand and when we examine our constitution and when we see lastly the power reserved with the president of india to grant pardon we can definitely correlate with our indian legal history as to how <coughs> these powers from where and what is that what has been the source of those powers switching on friends to the years later as we know after lot many years different rulers different princely states different parts of british india ultimately when independence of india was in the offing then serious deliberations begin to ensure that the new nation it shall have its own charter drawn up on the noble ideals handed down by our progenitors while looking towards the horizons of hope expectations and aspirations when our constitution constituent assembly that started the begin its work much before the appointed date of 15th august 1947 took up this task of framing the constitution of india it had to traverse through a great many challenges which included the challenges relating with related with accession of the states with uh, nearly 562 princely states being there and uh, a document was required to be drafted which ought to be acceptable to all partition itself has thrown so many challenges with lots of lives being lost the britishers themselves the erstwhile rulers well they well contributed their part in creating well so many problems care including well destroying of the manufactured goods and our industries even the even the land in the name of land reforms we were having so many systems in place we were rather than of reforming or rather than being of use they were the instruments of exploitations then there were diversities the the india the this geographical area of immense diversity of significant cultural linguistic regional caste and other distinctions these were serious challenges there were so many other challenges the constituent assembly had set together to begin their task on 22nd january 1947 dr rajendra prasad the chairperson of the constituent assembly read out that resolution before the constituent assembly which had been the resolve i would say for that constituent assembly it had been the resolve then and it remains a resolve ever and i am tempted to quote that as to what was read 
on 22nd January 1947. The resolve was this. The Constituent Assembly declares its form and sovereign resolve to proclaim India as an independent sovereign republic and to draw for her future governance a constitution. That is a job beginning. But the promises were wherein it's said wherein the territories that now comprise British India, the territories that now form the Indian states and such other parts of India as are outside British India and the states as well as such other territories as are willing to be constituted into the independent sovereign in India shall be a union of them all. Say, willing voluntary participation and including ourselves into India. Wherein the set territories, whether with their present boundaries or with such other as may be determined by the Constituent Assembly and thereafter according to the laws of the Constitution, shall possess and retain the status of autonomous units together with residuary powers and exercise all powers and functions of government and administration, save and accept such powers and functions as are vested in or assigned to the union or as are inherent or implied in the union or resulting therefrom. Wherein all power and authority of the sovereign independent India, its constituent parts and organs of the government are derived from the people. Wherein shall be guaranteed and secured to the people of India justice, social, economic and political, equality or status of opportunity and before the law, freedom of thought, expression, belief, faith, worship, vocation, association and action subject to law and public morality and wherein adequate safeguards shall be provided for minorities, backward classes and tribal areas and depressed and other backward classes whereby shall be maintained the integrity of the territory of the Republic and its sovereign rights on land, sea and air according to justice or law of civilized nations end. Point number eight is, is an ever alive point. This ancient land attains its rightful and honored place in the world and make its full and willing contribution to the promotion of world peace and the welfare of mankind. Well, these were the promises, friends, made even when we just, our forefathers, when just sat together to draft the constitution, much before even drafting began. These promises are the promises always with us and we live with them and we make all our endeavors to fulfill these promises constantly, continuously. Friends, uh, in the Constituent Assembly making of the Constitution, there were arguments about whether India should choose a presidential or a parliamentary form of government or a hybrid of the two. As we all are aware, the debate ended in favor of parliamentary form of the government, which was considered to be best, suit, best suited to us. And it was incorporated. And because it was considered that it, it, incorporated, the, it incorporated the principle of more responsibility to more stability. K. M. Munshi said, and I quote again, our constitutional traditions have become parliamentary and we have now all our provinces functioning more or less on British model. As a matter of fact, today, the Dominion Government of India is functioning as a full-fledged parliamentary government. Thus, the Constituent Assembly adopted the parliamentary system for India due to the Indian polity's familiarity with the working of the British system 
and uh, of the government representation of diverse interest groups and the fear of of course there were fear of deadlock also between the executive and the legislature in that at that particular point of time in the india's nascent democracy could not have afforded it's uh, indicated uh, by an historian harshan kumara singham that what we evolved and what we provided uh, starting from the westminster model but what we have provided could adequately be co- called eastminster uh, well model of governance friends when we when we appreciate when we look at the constitution which was framed with those fundamental resolves and its functioning is we have to appreciate the fundamental that this is a document where which which carries with in itself the inherent and intrinsic elements which provide for healing also by itself and that is how we have been able to every day march ahead come what may and come what be the challenges a a a simple example if uh, we remind ourselves of emergency a particular period where there had been regarding which the the law students and the law scholars would have so many things to say that maybe emergency was rather an anathema to the constitutional norms and principles but our constitution itself and the principles provided therein ensured that even after this democracy even after i'm sorry even after emergency even when emergency came ultimately well elections were held by that very government that had declared emergency elections were held that government was voted out of the power other government came even that other government also went out and some well they were displaced and so on continuously we have marched ahead the fundamental of all this has always remained our constitution carrying certain fundamental values what are those values because of which well, everything has been handled by all of us everything has been dealt with by all of us together if uh, there are of course the values as well when we talk of basic structure we know that there are certain basics in that basic structure itself well and some of them it's it's for for we all of us the law students particularly to not only admire but to keep on developing on those ethos those norms those values the values of promise hope bandhuta the fraternity i repeat ahimsa and even critical reasoning critical reasoning critical thinking is a part of our constitution and that is very interesting and significant to understand i was just reading uh, to yesterday only that chat gpt the new norms these days people are so keen to know about it and how it operates well chat gpt was uh, asked to take the upsc exam and he could not secure more than 54 marks out of 100 right but then when uh, chat gpt that is a different matter because uh, uh, artificial intelligence can never be a substitute for human intelligence and the human intuition as uh, uh, there is one particular factor that einstein used to say that uh, intuitive mind is a god's gift and a rational mind is a faithful servant we have created a society where it where, where, which uh, respects the servant honors the servant more and uh, forgets the, about the god's gift but the the fact of the matter is that well in this part of the world we as a nation we have never forgotten that god's gift 
and that is that God's gift, that intuitive mind that always keeps on working and that's how we keep on evolving from any of those challenges. The critical, I was reminding that uh, chat GPT only because when chat GPT was asked as to what are uh, the ways of clearing or what are the requirements basically of clearing a UPSC exam, although chat GPT itself cannot, uh, couldn't clear it, but it's indicated, well, the, uh, the, exp the, the subject expertise, one, time management, two, and three was critical reasoning. Now this critical thinking or reasoning, whether it is human intelligence or it is artificial intelligence also recognizes it. That critical thinking will, remains in the base of every development. And we as society working together, we have, we have constantly been developing on and we never leave that intuition, intuitive mind well, anywhere away from our analysis, even our rational thinking also, and that is how we progress. The values of constitution, as I was indicating, uh, you, will, uh, you can relate them back to the riti or the rit, which are even the precursor to dharma. And uh, riti, the fundamentals were all set that even the sun, moon, and the stars, they conduct themselves according to a few set of values and principles. They do not deviate ordinarily. Dharma also says that, well, there are certain basic, certain commons. We remain glued to them and progress on them. Fraternity is one of the constitutional value. Bandhuta, as we say, non-violence, ahimsa is also Another constitutional value, uh, we, we, it's, it's interesting to notice that while, while inserting Article 51, capital A, of fundamental duties, well, apart from all other duties, well, its clause I indicates it's our duty to abjure violence. Ahinsa is a part of, part of our, our, our values. The hope and promise is also a part of our values. That is how we have every day look at the dynamics of the progression. Critical reasoning, as I indicated, well, it's, uh, has always been our part. Mahabharat itself gives when, uh, when uh, uh, Krishna has to well, give so many of the lessons to Arjun, critical reasoning had been one of the parts of those uh, uh, teachings. Switching on to what we have progressed, what we have done after 1960s, 1960s we brought in Green Revolution, wherein the use of technology, with the use of technology, we started increasing all the productions. Now, and we have reached to a position where the India is the largest producer of pulses and the second largest producer of rice and wheat. During the white revolution of the 1970s, with the Operation Flood, the India has been transformed from a milk deficient country to a milk capital of the world, producing 22% of the world's milk. India became nuclear power way back in the year 1974. And again, 24 years later, we became a full-fledged nuclear state with uh, the experiments at Pokhran. Very interesting, friends. In 1984, uh, Rakesh Sharma and uh, a, an Indian Air Force pilot, when he begged the ticket to space, joined the Soviet Union Soyuz T-11 expedition, the then Prime Minister is said to have famously asked him a question when he was in the state, when he, space, Upar se Bharat kaisa dikhta hai? How India appears from the space? 
and what he replied was, and these are the things, they, they always remain with us. We are always proud of ourselves. What his reply, as uh, it is uh, said, he said that, Main bagher kisi jijak ke keh sakta hoon, sare jahaan se achha. That is what, that is what Rakesh Sharma, Rakesh Sharma would say. These, kuch hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari, that remains a part of all of us. That has always been, you, you look at the examples, examples, these are just, just indications. What I am indicating, why I am indicating this, when we are talking of 75 years of parliamentary democracy, well, looking at the prospects, we are proud of what until now, hitherto, we have done. Challenges, yes. Challenges would continue to remain and challenges are there in every society, in every nation. But it's the manner of dealing with those challenges and our country with the vast diversities, with the populations, with several other, even, even for that matter, uh, if, we, if we look at, uh, means, uh, but before coming to those kind of challenges, um, I'm, I'm tempted to uh, recount what we have done in space. Uh, Aryabhat, we put it there, Gaganyan, it, it's likely to now go for another expedition uh, to Mars. The mobiles which we have, the net connectivity which we have, rolling out even 5G services now, Liberal, liberalization of Indian economy and uh, we have a whole lot of transformation. There are huge success stories in every field, including our sports person also. Healthcare, as we all know, we have just now talked about and in the, how we have handled COVID and as at present, India has administered over 2 billion COVID vaccination doses and becoming the second country to hit the milestone. A few challenges existing, remaining, reminding ourselves of our duties were indicated. Apart from those challenges, if we, if we, when we are taking stock of the things, I recount a few larger serious challenges we came through. Those challenges resulted in terms of loss of lives also. But India has well, with its ethos and its fraternity has always progressed. 1984 Bhopal gas tragedy, we are not forgotten. It was one of the world's worst industrial disasters. And the effects have still not worn off. The devastating earthquake of Latur, 1993, and of Gujarat 2001, tsunami of 2004 of Indian Ocean. The nature's calamities and other factors, including the wars which we have to, we, we were forced to fight with our neighbors. One thing remains common. India has always, out of every such challenge come out more stronger. As we were discussing in the morning also with the professors, that COVID on one end threw so many of challenges, but even those challenges converted into opportunity. Of course, well, this is a kind of an attack on the humanity where the entire humanity was shaken all over the world. But India dealt with that and coming to the judiciary, well, the transformation of judiciary into in the digitized world rapidly to the extent that now access to justice in the physical form is available where from any nook and corner of the country, well, the people are able to reach none less but even the Supreme Court. The, even the accused persons are presented to the court 
by video conferencing. We are able to provide, we, we, have, we have, even out of this challenge also, we as a country, as a nation, and together we have, well, keeping our basics always with us, we have progressed. Of course, judiciary, when they talk of judiciary, judicial decisions, they have contributed their part to shape, uh, to iron out rough creases also, to give proper shape to a few things which were missing or they were filling in the gaps also. A few quick uh, touch of the cases may be opposite at this moment, Keshwanan Bharti, we are all aware. The basic structure of the constitution is unchangeable and cannot be modified even by two-third majority of parliament. It well imparts a sense of certainty and stability regarding the concepts which constitute our constitution. Menaka Gandhi versus Union of India, that law should be just, fair and non-discriminatory. Well, it is, it, it erects a massive wall of non-interference against the state and the government vis-a-vis -vis an individual. Olga Telis, Bombay Municipal Corporation, the payment dwellers and slum, uh, slum dwellers and the correlation of uh, their rights vis-a-vis -vis Article 21 and the right to life. Nilabati Bera, the unfortunate loss of life in custody. Supreme Court advocates on record that nine judge bench decision, judges second decision as we know, where the court ruled that supremacy in the appointment procedure concerning constitutional courts was to be given to the Chief Justice of India. The court also held that the influence of executive must be checked. Indra Sahani, this is Union of India, equality was explained in terms of substantive and real equality, not just equality in phase or in phrase or equ but equality in substance the court observed that those who suffered historical disadvantages deserve to be given affirmative action and support such as dalits scs sts vishaka is a classic example where the supreme court filled in the gap and which ultimately led to the parliament passing that Act in the year 2013, the Sexual Harassment at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act, TMA Pai Foundation, the 11 judges bench decision, where the, the Supreme Court well, reasserted the, about the rights of the minorities to establish and administer the educational institutions and how the government regulations could be framed. Aruna Schoenberg, well, distinction between active and passive euthanasia. K.S. Puttaswamy, Aadhaar scheme judgment. Janihit Abhyan, as it was being referred to, well, I had a privilege to be a part of that 103rd constitutional amendment. And the latest one, delivered a couple of days back by the Supreme Court, Anub Baranwal, on the procedure for appointment of election commissioners. That is another study for anyone to imbibe as to how the Supreme Court makes attempts to fill in the gaps whenever found, which indeed require filling up, so as to make democracy a meaningful one, and yet even in this Arun Baranwal judgment also. Ultimately, the Supreme Court has left it to the parliament to do the needful as per the mandate of the constitution. Friends, this is how our institutions had been at function. So 
we can reasonably say that well in these 75 years we are not been sitting idle we are not been well being complacent that whatever we have achieved it, uh, democracy we have achieved uh, sorry independence and then we have formed a democracy and uh, it's done we know it that every day is a new challenge as we force ahead with this our shared vision of a new india filled with potential and promise which are rooted in the values of our constitution and driven by the validity uh, driven particularly by the validity of those basic notions as also the vitality of our youth we are faced of course always with new challenges this has been a journey of transformative constitutionalism also there have been many many challenges and there are many challenges now which the 21st century is presenting presenting to us including the challenges out of the cyber space but we are dealing with that we had been dealing with that and we would continue to deal with that i remind at this juncture apart from of course article 51 capital a is uh, could always be our fundamental to be our guiding factor any moment whenever in doubt we can look at article 51a and could know as to well what we need to do or how to shape or reshape ourselves but at this moment talking to this august gathering i am tempted to read it again clause b of article 51a which is one of the fundamental duties of the citizens that is to cherish and follow the noble ideals which inspired our national struggle for freedom on the when well, we must effort we must, we must respect the efforts commitments and sacrifices of our forefathers but although 75 years have passed we are we would be having new struggles as i again remind we repeat but why we remind ourselves of freedom struggle not merely to remember the struggles we faced in attaining independence but to remember that those noble ideals had inspired us to the path of the freedom and they will take us anywhere anywhere to deal with any challenge friends thank you so very much having given me this opportunity before concluding uh and thanks for your patience before concluding since i see a lot many students are here and uh, well my compliments to the law faculty of uh, banaras hindu university uh, having uh, organized this seminar and particularly uh, having the students with us and uh, since uh, the the our students the particularly the law students are the hopes and aspirations of tomorrow talking to them particularly and of course uh, this particular story there is one particular story which i am always tempted to narrate recount read reread remind myself also remind ourselves also even of course it is for the students they would be going a long way ahead it but it is otherwise for all of us to remember and keep on reminding ourselves that story is uh, of course uh, uh, you might have come across that story one way or the other but it is worth uh, uh, re remembering if you don't mind the story is about uh, the great uh, poet uh, kalidas kalidas was a great name sir and uh, as we all know of his times he was the masterpiece he was the ultimate as we are told kalidas uh, once was traveling that's how this narrative goes kalidas was once uh, traveling 
uh, from one place to another uh, all by himself all alone and uh, no companion was there so he was crossing through a jungle it was a hot summer day he felt thirsty as the story goes he entered a village and he was passing through a village he saw an old lady drawing water from a well he was feeling thirsty so he went uh, a learned man he was and uh, sober of course well cultured man of course so he went there did pranam namaste to the old lady and said mother i'm thirsty please give me a handful of water mata pyas lagi hai ek thoda pani mil jaye the old lady looked at him said pani to pila dete beta well i'll be giving you water no problem tell me who are you now this particular question was problematic for great kalidas after all he is such a great name everybody knows him everybody is supposed to know him how an illiterate lady of a village an old lady who has got nothing otherwise to do with anything of literature uh, would be asking him his name who are you means his introduction and now after all, after all he is a great man now how it is it is uh, problematic for him to introduce himself it's rather demeaning for him पानी तो पिला देते हैं बेटा तुम बताओ तुम कौन हो तुम कौन हो इज ए प्रॉब्लम क्वेश्चन कालिदास सेड सोबर मैन इंटेलिजेंट मैन ही वॉज ही सेड मदर टेक मी एज ए ट्रेवलर मैं एक पथिक हूं एक यात्री हूं द ओल्ड लेडी सेड नो यू कांट बी ए ट्रेवलर ट्रेवलर आर ओनली टू sun and the moon they keep on traveling you can't be a true traveler suraj aur chandrama do hi hote hain jo lagatar yatra karte hain tum yatri nahi ho sakte kalidas learned sober intelligent man said okay mother take me as a guest ye maan lijiye main atithi hu no you can't be a guest either guests are only two youth and the wealth they do not stay whatever you try jawani aur sampatti ye do hi atithi hote wo kabhi rukte nahi hain tum atithi nahi ho sakte okay mother now this was his patience was being tested he was feeling thirsty also okay mother take me as a tolerant person make sahanshil vyakti no you can't be tolerant either tolerance are only two the earth and the tree you keep on stamping on them you keep on misbehaving with them they always nurture you they always hold you earth mother earth holds you and the tree would always be giving you fruits even if you throw uh, stones on it so you can't be tolerant okay i am a stubborn person no you can't be stubborn also stubborn are only two hair in the nails you keep on cutting them they keep on growing you can't be stubborn either okay i am a fool no you can't be a fool either fools are only two a king who rules without knowing law and a psychophant who praises that king you can't be a fool either kalidas was well checkmated he fell at the feet of that lady said mother 
I have no answers. He knew by that time that the lady knows much more than myself. He said, Mother, I am very sorry. Uh, I don't have answers. Please, I am dying of, well, I am thirsty, I am dying. Please, Pani Pila. The question was, who are you? He fell at the feet of that lady. And, Mother, I am sorry. When he got up, that is how this lesion goes. This is, of course, a story, but uh, it, it gives us uh, always to remind ourselves. As a lesion goes, when uh, Kalidas got up, what he saw was that goddess Saraswati was standing before him. That uh, old lady was not there, it was Ma Saraswati was there and she said, that look here Kalidas, you are really an intelligent person, you are having all the intellect, you are a learned man, no problem. But remember one thing, that your intellect and your education is of no use when it, feel, it feeds your ego. It had been your ego that was problematic. When I asked you who are you, you felt offended. Please don't ever feel offended. And that I always remind that any day anybody asks you a question, who are you, please humbly, simply answer as to who are you. Thank you so very much.